Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another program from the Carnegie Historical Museum in Fairfield. The museum is located on the third floor of the old library building, and entrance is by the uh, elevator, so it's convenient <laughs> for everybody to get here. The museum has been blessed over the last year or two, or actually throughout its history of over 100 years, to receive many gifts to the museum. To my knowledge, I don't think the museum has ever purchased a single item for its facility. And during the last couple of years, we've received a lot of gifts to the museum, some of them very historically significant, some we would like to build displays around, and we'd like to recognize some of those things that we've had uh, donated to the museum because they do have stories behind them. One of the ones that we received after we started the new board a couple of years ago was a pretty sizable monetary gift from Gene Sells in memory of Paul. And of course, Paul worked for many, many years, spent thousands of hours into the museum. And one of the things that we would like to do with that uh, particular memorial for Paul is to create a, a guided tour on tape of the museum. That way, and I think some of you are familiar going to the Art Institute or other large museums where you have a tape and you can have a walking tour throughout the museum. And that's what we would like to do is to record a tour of the museum so that people could walk around at their convenience and tour the museum and have a guided tour. And I think it's a very worthwhile thing uh, to do for the museum and it's something that uh, will really help people identify and understand the different exhibits that we have. A number of the other things that we've been giving uh, to the museum, and we'll go kind of in order of what they've been given for the last couple of years. Uh, one is, uh, Mark, would you like to talk about the programs there and then I'll yeah. get to the next thing. Oh, oops. Are you gonna... Go ahead. Here again, we don't know what the right, right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. Okay, we have um, a number of Parsons College festival programs. And I know when I was a young kid in junior high and high school, uh, going to the Parsons College festivals in the summer was a really big deal. And people from all over Southeast Iowa enjoyed them, Burlington, Iowa City, Atoma, Fort Madison, wherever. Uh, we didn't have Hancher Auditorium and some of those facilities like we do now. And so Fairfield was really quite a cultural mecca. Um, Marsha Wallace, who was well known on television and sitcoms for a while, was a student at Parsons and was discovered by... Sid Spade. Sid Spade was, a, was the uh, theater director, but who was the guy that came in? The actor, played Harvey. Oh, isn't that terrible? Maybe I better open this up and find out. Well, we'll think of it. <laughs> anyway, he was on TV a lot. Jimmy Stewart. Was it Jimmy Stewart? No. 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 Jim, Jimmy Stewart did Harvey the movie, but this was Harvey, oh, okay. oh. Harvey the play at Parsons. Oh. Isn't that terrible? Oh. Well, anyway, he had Bob Newhart. Bob Newhart. Thank you. Yeah. Glad we have an audience. Anyway, Bob Newhart was uh, the guest star that summer. And, and took Marsha on as one of his proteges. And she co-starred co with him in his uh, Bob Newhart show mm -hmm. comedy series. She was his receptionist. Uh, I remember this production was fantastic. It was really great. There were just lots and lots of uh, well-known people. Joey Brown, I remember seeing him. Yeah. I was staying overnight at a friend's house, and we went to the Woody's Cafe. And Joey Brown was eating dinner and back in the corner. And that was really exciting. So there were lots and lots of, of big names that came to Fairfield. Eddie Bracken, uh, this guy. Pat. O'Brien. Pat yeah. O'Brien. Yeah. I remember him in a, in a parade downtown. And the music man was McDonald Carey. Yeah. So there were lots of wonderful uh, productions here at Parsons. And these were donated by Martha Flint Spa and Mrs. Andrew Sim. So we appreciate that, and we'll add that to our Parsons archive. We have a number of things in our Parsons archive, and we've had uh, a, a committee of people going through those. That Bob Tree, Frankie Beatty, Betty Swingles, and some others have given a lot of hours going through the Parsons memorabilia that we have, and we would like to make a better display of that, and also uh, catalog it so people that who are doing historical referencing can can have a better access to those things. But we do have a number of Parsons things, and these are a great addition. All right. 
Don, would you be able to tell us a little bit about the rocking chair that we have? Now this walnut folding rocking chair came from Parsons College and it's Sorry. upholstered with fabric that was at Ankeny Hall. It was salvaged, I believe Ankeny Hall caught fire and burned and this was some of the old carpeting in Ankeny Hall that was salvaged. Now according to this information we have, um, a professor, does he say Sigurd? Mm -hmm. John Jorgensen. Jorgensen. Um, he got this chair from Will Turner, and it was up. It's upholstered, as I said, in this carpeting. And we received the chair from uh, Christina Jorgensen Alrichs, who was his daughter, his daughter-in-law, I guess. No, his daughter, and she married an Alrichs. She lives in uh, Lafayette, Indiana, and she sent that chair to us. So we we're very happy to have it. Uh, did you want to go on the other second thing? She also sent us this really great fossil that she found in Cedar Creek bed uh, in the old Libertyville road, under the old Libertyville Road Bridge. I think our records show that it was found in 1937, so it's been around a few years. A few years longer than 1937, too. Yeah. But it's a very interesting fossil, and I think those of, the, of you that are here can see the fern here, and it's, it's really a classic. Uh, <coughs> Uh, fossil for our collection. Uh, and going a little bit farther with the fossil things, uh, we do have a number of them in our collection, and so uh, I think this will be a great addition to, uh, to show the various things that are right here in Jefferson County. And the local lapidary club has expressed an interest in you know, revamping and updating our uh, mineral and fossil collection as well. So that's another project we have on the back burner. Seems like everything's on the back burner. We, we, there's a lot of things we want to do, but because we're a volunteer organization, uh, it's hard to get, you know, get everything off the ground. But uh, we have so much in the collection that there's a lot of possibilities here. Now we have some uh, pyras, the Parsons College yearbook that were donated by, uh, who is that? By Daniel Hefner. Oh, okay. uh, a number of pyras photos and uh, we have a letter sweater that was also donated and Dot, I don't think we brought that down today but it is the old-fashioned colors of Parsons College rather than the new, what we thought of in the later years as the bright green and white uh, it actually is the, the more pinky color for the letter. Rose and green. Rose and green, that's right, those were the original colors. When was that Parsons changed? Country. Does anybody know? In Robert's era. Uh, okay. I don't know. So it was in the 50s when that changed. Okay. One of the things that you, you see when you come into the front door out there is a, a fairly recent addition to the museum, and, and I think it's significant, and that's a, a seat from the old high school auditorium. Uh, Mike Burgraff, one of our board members and vice president of our board, was one of the people who helped take out those museums, and, or take out those uh, seats, and purchased one of those and donated it to the museum, and I think it's a very proper thing to have here as a part of our museum. And, uh, it seems like right out by the front door seems a logical place to have it set. Yeah, it's a nice Art Deco design. Uh, it has the original uh, wide well, kind of a corduroy-like uh, upholstery on the back and the original upholstery on the seat. There weren't too many of those left after all these years. But uh, you know, with the new seats in the auditorium, they're more comfortable, but it is good to have the original Art Deco seats to refer to. One of the areas that we want to uh, more properly display within the museum is our collection of um, military items. And some of the more recent ones that we have were donated by Nadine Franklin. Uh, I remember Nadine and Paul from my early years in school. I had uh, uh, Nadine as a homeroom teacher in junior high school for three years and went to high school and lo and behold, I had Paul for a homeroom teacher. So I had the, Fra the, the Franklin uh, couple for six or seven years as homeroom teachers. But I remember Paul very well in the industrial arts and drafting and other courses that uh, he taught me. And he served many years in the city council and you know, right. was a faithful member of his community. So we're appreciating this remembrance of him. I'm sure he remembers some American history too. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of the items, uh, uh, John, would you like to discuss what these are uh, a little bit more than I, I do? Well, I had, a li I had a list right here. We have okay. um, an Army footlocker. And that we did not bring down from our, from our storage area. And a copy of Up From Marseille. Now, is that a book? I haven't, I haven't seen everything. Oh, it's over here. Okay. 
And the two uniforms, the winter overcoat that Jean's uh, shown, a cap and coat from a German officer's uniform, which, yeah, that's a beautiful, I mean, those guys knew how to put on a show, didn't they? Well, one of the things that we would like to do is to enlarge our military collection. We have a number of uniforms already in our collection. These are brand new things that we just don't have duplicates of, so we're very fortunate to have them. But if there's anybody in the community who would like to help us uh, properly uh, display the military things, uh, organize them, and uh, help us tell a story of our area service people that served, uh, we sure like to have some volunteers to help with that. These are great additions to the museum, and they're in absolutely perfect shape. I, there's, I don't think there's a moth hole in them or anything. They're just absolutely perfect. Better not be. <laughs> <laughs> well, he says there better not be any moth holes in here. Well, and we do have a small operating budget, and we've purchased uh, some archival, uh, like tissue and different things to help preserve things more adequately. So uh, they'll be well taken care of. We've gotten, while well, I'm thinking about it, we've gotten uh, also these sleeves to put over the fluorescent light uh, bulbs to cut out the ultraviolet rays. And we also have uh, a film to put over the windows to filter out the ultraviolet rays because light is very harmful to, to uh, you know, fabrics and so forth. And this will help preserve the collection. So we're glad to have Do access to this. Do you need any more Air Force uniforms? You know, I'm not sure what the inventory is, but. Uh, Possibly, I, we just have to go through things and see what we have. But here again, we're, we've been given things and you know, we, we acquire it, we go through the paperwork, we make a card, but as far as an actual inventory, it's all kind of stirred in together. So we need to, to inventory things to see if we do need more Air Force stuff. But well, I, I think it would be nice because then we could change our display uh -huh. and honor different military men in uh -huh. our uh, cases, you know, take the one out, put yeah. another one in. So I think it would be a good idea to have an Air Force footlocker too. Oh yeah, we definitely don't have one of those. Yeah. Uh, and here again, people with an interest in military history who would like to help us with these displays, you know, let Gene know, and we can sure set something up. That'd be great. I'm wondering about a World War II uh, area. You do. I don't know just what you have here as far as space is concerned. I'm getting the idea that there's not much of it. Yep. Space, I mean, we have a lot of space, but we have an awful lot of stuff to put in that space. Yes. Yeah, space is definitely a premium for our, for our museum. But Mark and I and, and the board have talked about a number of different things that we can do to rearrange, uh, to build some new cabinets, uh, to consolidate better. Sometimes we can squeeze things together a little bit more to display more things. And so there are definitely ways we can better utilize the space, and one of those will be with a military display because we need to recognize our local service people who, uh, who served our country yeah. right from our area here. Who decides what qualifies as the, as the pieces that can be used? Okay, the question was what qualifies as a piece that we might be interested in? Uh, to my knowledge, we've never refused anything. At this time, we just take everything uh, that is given to us and then we, uh, uh, we assume the right to decide later, depending on how we change our displays. We but, hate to say no to anything. But at this point, we have never sold anything either. So everything that is given to the museum does stay with the museum. And hopefully we can do things so we can rotate displays better. And uh, having a duplicate of something certainly isn't a bad, bad situation to have, because sometimes you can utilize more than one of the same uniform in a display by having one hanging in the background, another on a mannequin, or something like that. So uh, at this point, uh, we're open to take just about anything. We're not going to say no to anything, I think, at this point. So we certainly, but if you have a question as to whether it would be a proper uh, uh, addition to our museum, just call either Mark or I or one of the other board members, and we certainly <coughs> visit with you and, and uh, would sure like to have it. Because we've had things donated that put a different light on the collection. We think, oh, yeah, maybe we could have a display that goes in a direction that had originally occurred to us before. But here again, it's a matter of time and just getting it done. OK. One of the other collections that we have donated to the museum fairly recently was uh, a, a group of items from, that uh, belonged to General Henry Huglin. And Doc, can you tell us a little more about General Huglin? Uh, he was a Fairfield native, is that right? 
May I add? In those days, they called it Hugland. Hugland? Well, it looks like Hugland to me, but Hugland is the proper way to say it. Thank you. Well, I suppose people in this audience know more about this man than I do, but he was uh, a native of uh, Fairfield and uh, retired from the Air Force. And this is his uniform. He wanted uh, his uniform displayed in our museum. He this bought the mannequin for us and the wig and has given us general directions as to how to display his flags and this picture, which we, <clears throat> we will eventually be doing. But uh, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know a whole lot of information about the man. Anybody here can add to that? Frankie? One of the things that their family was unusual that they had three sons who went to West Point, and it is unusual for a family to have three sons attend West Point. So the comment was that three Hugland sons went to West Point. Yes. Yeah, that is pretty significant. So in addition to his collection, his uniform, we have also the framed photo. Uh, we have an American flag and also his general's flag that are on the back wall that I didn't uh, bring out. We also have some patches and, and uh, various insignias that are in the cabinet over here that we didn't bring out. And we also have this uh, picture, and this was a collector from a collector set, a limited edition print commemorating the 50th anniversary of the air victory in the Pacific. And uh, we do have uh, the card that came with it to show the general uh, documentation of it, and it's uh, quite a nice uh, photo that, that we can work into a display of uh, military items. We also have uh, Judy Herzog to thank for the hairstyling. He looked like he was trying to be one of the Beatles before we got that trimmed down. But <laughs> she did a nice job. It was pretty bad. It looked pretty bad. <laughs> but it, look, it looks very nice now. So thank you, Judy. Well, another collection that we had donated to the museum fairly recently was a collection of dolls from Bob and Marine Wynn. And it, they were uh, documented, documented in an earlier uh, uh, program that we had on dolls that uh, uh, was given here at the museum. And I don't think that we got any of those out, but they were documented earlier. Uh, the display is around the corner on the other side of that, uh, the ladies' cabinet with the vintage clothing. And it's a very nice collection of dolls that uh, the winds gave to us. Uh, so if you get a chance before you leave, go around that and take a look at them. We have a number of different dolls within the collection, all the way from Indian dolls, uh, some native, native Indian things and some other uh, various pieces. And so uh, that's another place that we need to consolidate and put things together. And I think we can make a very nice display of uh, historically significant doll collection. How old do you want them to be? Uh, before 30? That would be fine. I, as the question was, how old would we like to have things be within the museum? I think there are things significant historically, such as the auditorium seat that really doesn't have a lot of age, but it can be still historically significant to Fairfield. And our emphasis in the future will be more things that were used in Fairfield, things that uh, are uh, from our area, so we can tell our own story here in Fairfield a little bit more. So as far as age, I think the important thing is, does it tell a story? Is it, a, is it something that's significant to fill in a gap time-wise? And so I think anything that uh, uh, tells that kind of a story, whether it's 60 years old or older, uh, either one fits very nicely. So I but think that's fine. specifically of dolls. Mm -hmm. Well, the Wynn collection are from the 40s, 50s, and 60s, so they're not really that old. But it's a nice collection, and the children love, love it when they come here. So. Uh, well, I have one from the 30s. That would be nice. Something like that. We sure. have some lovely older dolls, in this case, over here. We give them. In. We give a large number of tours to school children. And as Dot said, that's one of the things that picks the interest of, of younger people. Uh, so I think those are the kinds of things that are important for the museum to have. We want the museum to be educational. And we want, that, want it to be something that, that uh, the youth are interested in when they come up here. So the dolls are one more thing to pick that interest of, of children. So I think it's important that we do have a display yeah. such as and, this. You know, we have the porcelain head dolls in the cabinet here to the south on the south wall that are mostly from the 1800s, but it looks like there's a Shirley Temple doll in there. <laughs> but anything, I think, that goes decade by tech, decade since the founding of this community would certainly be instructive. So here again, we're not going to turn it down. That's right. 
Another uh, recent addition to the museum collection is a Masonic sword, and this was from uh, Scott Hilliard. Uh, it's a Masonic sword originally owned by Martin Liblin of Fairfield. And we do have the scabbard that goes with it. Oh, I think I have the wrong one here. Which one, which sword is this? The Wind Collection, the Winds gave it. Oh, oh winds. this one is from the Wind Collection also. The one that was from originally owned by uh, Martin Liblin is this Masonic sword. And again, it came from Fairfield and it will tell a part of Fairfield's history. And it's uh, inscribed with a lot of nice engraving on the top. Mark, do you have anything to? Boy, I don't know anything well, I'd about I'd like to add something stuff. to that because that had a very interesting way, the way we got it. This man from California, Scott Hilliard, contacted Bert Baird first and asked her if we would be interested in this sword that he had bought at an auction in California. And so Verda got in touch with me after she sent him some interesting information. She was able to look up the um, uh, obituary of Martin Liblin. And he was a, a, a sheriff here, or a policeman, a sheriff here. And he died quite uh, young, in his 50s, in 1904, I believe he died. So evidently, part of the Liblin family went to California, or someone bought that here and carried it to California. But this man bought it at a, um, an estate auction, and he paid $100 for it and wanted to give it to us. He sent it, he made a nice wooden box, shipped it to us, and we have some interesting correspondence from, us, from him, and he was very happy to give it to us. So we feel very lucky to have it, because it's a beautifully engraved sword. And he wanted nothing in return, other than sword. the fact that he thought it belonged in Fairfield. And it is inscribed with Martin Liblin on the sword and on the, the scabbard. It's a very nice addition to uh, illustrate Fairfield history. But we are not able to find any member that is of that Liblin family in, the, in Fairfield anymore. Okay, is this the power here? Mm -hmm. Is that the one? Is this the, yes. okay, this, yeah, this is a, another Pyra that was dealt, uh, donated by Eleanor Orth. It's a 1938 uh, edition. Shows the uh, Bar Height Chapel on the cover. But these are, here again, we need, we've, we've had these inventoried now. And uh, Frankie, do we have all the Pyras? No, and are there I, any I'm years? listing of the ones that are missing, and also there are a few missing in the public library. Ah. And if we have duplicates of any of these that we receive here, we thought it would be nice that, uh, if we fill in for them. And I, have, <coughs> I don't have it with me, but I do have a list of the missing pirates. And now, maybe there's some here that I didn't know about when sure. in the toy upstairs. So evidently the public library and we as well are missing some of the issues. Yes. Yes, we are. So give Frankie Beatty a call if you've got one that might fill a hole. We would like to have a complete set of both the high school quills and the Parsons College Pyras. Uh, I think at the same time, if uh, there are people who would happen to have Libertyville High School and Lockridge High School yearbooks, those would also be excellent additions because it is a county museum rather mm -hmm. than just Fairfield. But we did receive several of those from Joanne Lee, too, and from the Effner Estate, and then we got some from Ben Taylor, and so we're combining them all to make to try to get a complete set for yeah. the museum. Yeah. Okay, now we have Carl Zoldman's photo album. Here we get to show off our new archival top loaders. These are from a company called Light Impressions, and it's an archival, uh, is it polypropylene? I can't, not sure. whatever, it's acid free. So you just slip things in there and it's a nice way to view uh, paper documents without handling them, especially things that are brittle. But these are pictures of what, are these the fair store? Most of these are of the fair store. Uh, there are various interiors. I think there was a series of seven photographs all together. And there's four views of the interior of the fair store from postcards. Oh, uh, we got a correction here, Gene. Carl Zoman's photo album must still be upstairs. These okay. are these are Kathleen Bogner's fair store okay. pictures. Go so, ahead. <laughs> anyway, yeah, Kathleen donated those in October of last year. Um, 
but they're just they're showing interiors of the fair store which was located if you remember where Seifert's was on the south side of the square and the nice thing about this collection is that uh, members of the store staff are actually identified and like I've had gosh we had this postcard banging around in our desk store when I was a little kid forever and ever and ever I finally latched onto it and it's I can remember when it was in perfect condition well it's not anymore but uh, it's nice to know who these people actually were and I know Ben Taylor was even telling little anecdotes about some of them one day up here. Um, not everything was complimentary, but most of it was. <laughs> well, there are various groupings of the employees, and uh, several of them do have identifications. There's a nice picture of some celebration uh, where the front of the fair store, which is uh, the fair store was where the east half of the Cyphers building and the west half of Central Valley Bank was the fair store and uh, was quite a store in Fairfield's history. Uh, the interior photos show the, the various uh, extents to their merchandising that they went to, and it was quite elaborate. And the way they decorated with bunting and all kinds of plants and so forth. It's not like you see a the store today. In addition to those postcards, we do have a number of other postcards that were, were donated to uh, the museum. And uh, let's see, these were, these were pre presented by Virginia Harlan Hess of Windsor, Missouri. And they were brought to the museum by Mrs. Jane Mock, who lives in Mount Pleasant. And I think, she, were they here for a questers meeting? They came for a meeting. Yeah, they came here for a questers uh, meeting and brought these postcards with them. And, uh, some of them are, you know, there's some really nice ones. There's a, a nice view of the Bonifield cabin I'd never seen before. Uh, Methodist Church, the old Presbyterian Church before the steeples were taken off. Franklin School. And several courthouse photos, uh, you know, the Franklin School. A lot of Parsons College. We have uh, several of the Parsons College campus right here. Uh, we have a nice photo of the downtown area. A picture of East Burlington Street, uh, the bandstand in Central Park showing where the light tower was. And uh, I guess both of these do their nice Central Park photos. And one of the pictorial histories is that we use a lot in Fairfield is through postcards because uh, uh, these were from uh, probably 1906-1914 era. But uh, picture postcards were really common to use. And uh, they're a nice photographic uh, record of Fairfield at that time, almost 100 years ago. Uh, we have a picture of the Jefferson County Library here, and, and the roof line is different than it is now. Uh, the Orpheum Theater, which is now the Co-Ed Theater, and uh, there's two different postcards of that. I think they're the same view, but uh, if you look at the postcard very closely, you can see that it's definitely the same building. And here again, these are now in the, the archival um, slip covers, so we can handle them without you know, damaging the fragile cardboard, because you know they're getting old and brittle. They, weren't exactly done on museum quality materials. So uh, these will be around for a lot longer because we have them protected. Okay, oh, this this is a great piece. I don't know if I take it out or not, Gene. I'm not taking it okay. out. Okay, yeah, this, this is donated by Grace Graber. And this is absolutely enchanting. It's a, uh, is it printed on silk, do you think? It's, yes. It's a fan, it's an old public library building that we're in right now. Uh, like a, a black lacquer handle that shows a, a kind of a Japanese sort of uh, decoration on the handle. It was real popular in late Victorian times. You see that kind of motif on China a lot. But uh, it's really fragile. We, we could just hardly get it in there without it falling apart some more. But it was stitched around the edges and uh, held in this <coughs> metal frame. It's actually. Uh a wood frame. This, yeah, this, this has yeah, this, Oh, the, around the outside yeah, is a metal frame. Wood and it has a wood handle that has some carving on it. And uh, it's something that I had never seen before. Yeah, I didn't know it existed trendy. before Grace gave it to us. And where, the way it's situated right now is temporary, but here again we have it in, in an acid-free environment, so that'll, that will help keep it preserved. Um, I always enjoy a little bit of history. I always enjoy talking to Grace. She was my kindergarten teacher in country school for one year. so. She remembers me from those years, she says. But anyway, we really do appreciate her, her donation to the museum. And I think this is a very nice, And she said that th they've had it for more than 25 years, and it was in the things they had bought from, is it the Jilly House? G-I-L-L-Y at 500 North Main. So it's nice to have that provenance to know where, you know, where it came from. 
Um, I've lost my, sp oh, how about the Carter painting? Should we look at that now? Let's do that. Okay, let me get the fan out of there so we don't. I can go around it. Yeah. yeah, we've got the history for this someplace, and I'll just, shall I just open that up? And This was donated by uh, the Carters. And Lou. Lou and Emil, Emily, right? Yeah, Emily Carter. Okay, this is to certify that this oil painting of uh, Chautauqua Park and H. Pumphrey and his wife was painted by Mrs. Pumphrey and this is signed by W.C. Pumphrey. And the Pumphreys had the ice business. Mm -hmm. uh, they cut ice on Loudon Pond, I think, wasn't it? And uh, this okay. is a picture that she, that she did of okay. them. If you'll hold this, Mark, I'll right. read a little bit of the history that Emily wrote with this. Uh, she says, this is a painting of Chautauqua Park and H. Pumphrey and his wife painted by Mrs. H. Pumphrey. I first saw this painting at an auction in the 1960s. It was rolled up, moldy, had a torn place or two, and the other perimeters, especially two corners, were not complete. Next I saw it in the 1970s. Carlos Watson came to our door peddling it. It had been stretched on a stretcher frame, the hole repaired, and the corners finished. He said it had been finished by Bess Doherty, a local art teacher. Carlos said it had been incomplete because Mrs. Pumphrey died before finishing it, and verification of the painting was with it, signed by W.C. Pumphrey. And it's quite an inter interesting portrait of the back part of Chautauqua Park. Mm -hmm. And Mark, would you like to say anything specifically about some of the things that are in it? Well, we the style. It has kind of a kind of a romantic late 19th century kind of look to it. Um, real fluffy, uh, you know, kind of foliage in it. In it. And the um, I would say the influence may show is that, like the work of Corot, the French painter. Uh, kind of a dark atmospheric fluffiness to it. And it it must you know, and I'm just guessing that it's some little kind of pet secret they had between the two of them because the way he's holding his straw hat mm -hmm. behind her head. It makes you wonder what was what that was all there's, about. There's another story that we probably don't know. Yeah. But. I'm guessing that this harks back to their courting days. But it's a nice addition to the museum because it is a uh, an oil painting painted by a Fairfielder of Chautauqua Park, a Fairfield uh, longtime uh, historical site. And Henry Pumphrey gave the uh, land where the Little League Park is now for use, uh, use forever. Yeah, was that the site? That was where the Boy Scout swimming pool was. Now, did they take ice off of that, too? Was that one of their ice ponds? I don't remember no. if they did. I don't, I don't yeah. Too much chlorine and hickey stuff there. <laughs> All right. Yeah, this is one of those things that was donated that we just didn't know what to do with it, and we think we've got some ideas. Um, I can't remember who gave this. Uh, oh, for heaven's sake. Would you help us with the history of Berta? Would you help us with the history of the sign? I think you know the history of the sign. Oh, you don't? Oh, really? I thought you knew the history of the sign. Well, it is a, it's a metal sign from the Methodist Church at Glasgow, and it was one of those things that was given to us, and uh, because Frankly, nobody knew what else to do with it other than give it to the museum. But it spurred our interest, and, and I know Mark and I have talked a little bit, of what about a, a, an exhibit mm -hmm. of church history within the county? What about a, a map showing where all the churches were? Mm -hmm. And I know I have a few things from, from uh, the Salina Lutheran Church and a couple of other churches, and I think others do too. And we could put together a nice historical display of uh, the churches within the county because uh, we're losing a lot of the rural churches, and it's nice to remember them. So it's one of these things that, that was given to us, and we, we haven't put it into a display yet, but we think it might spur us on to do something even bigger. And, is that know, church in existence now at all? To my knowledge, it is not in, in existence. It's still there, though, isn't it? No. It is there. Um, okay. Uh, the conversation within the, the, the group here is that the church no longer exists, and I'm not sure where it was. Keith, would you know where it was? It was in the southwest portion of Glasgow. 
The southwest portion of Glasgow was where the church was. The south portion. <laughs> okay. Or a portion. A portion. Yeah. <laughs> but it's one of those. It's one of those pieces that was given to us that we think might uh, lead to something bigger and, and better because. Uh, uh, I know there's been a lot of research done in the past by count for the county churches, and this might be something that could be a nice little centerpiece to start us on something better. And here's a good example of how we just wish somebody would endow, a, endow us so that we could have a permanent curator because, oh, the paperwork on that's someplace upstairs, but it's not stuck to it, so we need to get a little tag on there to jog our memories the next time. So whoever donated it, thank you. We'll try to find out and let you know in a future program. Okay, uh, we've talked about great. Oh, well, we've talked about the clothing. Yes. Okay, yeah, we can do that. Okay, let's turn it over to Dot Hellcamp for a while, who's we'll take a uh, microphone. Who over. knows the history about the two clothing displays that we have over here? Uh, you, you, we talk about donations to the museum in, in the form of old items, but one of the mannequins was donated by Richard Thompson. And if we don't have mannequins, we don't have very much of a way to display these things. So we appreciate even donations such as that. So uh, Dot, why don't you take over the clothing? I, I was teasing Dot before we, the program began about the authentic hairstyles. I'm just tickled to death that we have 1870s hairdos on these ladies. Well, that's right. I think they look rather nice. But anyway. Better than um, if they were bald, like you said. Three years ago, I received a telephone call from uh, Evelyn Gamlet, as a matter of fact, telling me that she had a friend that wondering if we would like to have a wedding dress that had belonged to her husband's uh, grandmother. And I hadn't thought much about collecting vintage clothing at the time, but I said, fine, bring it over. So uh, one afternoon, uh, Dodie and Carl McLean arrived, and this wedding dress belonged to Carl's uh, grandmother, Catherine Menetre McLean. And uh, we were just tickled to get it because this is from the late, it's sometime in the 1800s. They're going to look up the exact date of the wedding. They have it in their information, but they couldn't give it to me exactly. So this dress was made, in those days they did not wear as many white wedding dresses as they wear today. And this was made in this beautiful fabric of brocades and satin. Now, she must have been a very, very tiny woman because we cannot get the three buttons closed at her waistline. It has quite, uh, uh, I should get my gloves on here. Of course, she probably was wearing a corset to help her out, too. <laughs> That's what I was going to show them. And it looks like it might have had a bustle, maybe. I, it's hard to tell. In the back, there's a nice bustle. But <clears throat> They wore, in those days, they corseted themselves to make themselves very thin, but this must have been also a very tiny lady. This is a three-piece dress, and inside here she has all the whalebone, the stays, and then she has this type that comes around, and that's also on the blouse to close this up very tightly so it brings her in. Now, I wasn't able to get the jacket on, too, but she has this lovely blouse on, and then this skirt. Now this skirt has a bustle in the back, and then this piece seems to come across the front and cover this piece of separate from the dress, and it covers it. But uh, this is really in good condition for as old as this dress is. Now this other one over here, this, this little baby dress, this little dress, uh, I don't know, are any of you familiar with Jean Harrison? This belonged to Jean Harrison's husband's grandmother, and Faith uh, Faith Harrison, now, I'm, that wasn't his grandmother, I don't no. believe. Uh, this dress was Faith Harrison's dress, and she wore it in 1906. She was born in 1906. I think that's just a darling little dress. Now, <clears throat> the history on this, this uh, cape here belonged to Anvilla Scott Mowry, and she was born in 1851. Now this cape is the only thing that they can authenticate that actually belonged to her. The dress was found in the box and they, it is of the same era that they can't be sure that it was actually her dress. But this cape is all, it's just so well done in this, uh, with all these beautiful jet beads and in very nice condition. And this dress here is of the same era and she has a beautiful petticoat on under this dress. 
The petticoats in those days, in the 1800s, were just as beautiful as the dresses. So we be, feel very fortunate to have these, uh, to begin to get some of these dresses. We have some that have been given to us from other uh, estates, and we just haven't gotten them together and prepared to display them. So. Thank you, Doc. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's another um, acquisition that's sparking some ideas for displays. This was, um, this actually came into being because of uh, the coal, coal house, or excuse me, the coal house, the coal palace display in Ottumwa. They were celebrating the centennial of the coal palace a, a couple years ago. And originally, I guess, the old coal palace had displays from all the surrounding counties, I think about 10 surrounding counties. And one of the desires of the Cole Palace uh, display at the Atoma Historical Museum was to recreate, or at least represent, each of the original displays from the various counties. So I asked Rick Donhauser if he would make a photographic blow-up of this picture that I had in my collection. Um, basically, it's a bulletin board of all the different uh, industrial concerns in Fairfield at, oh, in about 1915. And I also have a framed identification sheet that tells you when each of these companies was founded, but I can't find that now, of course. But anyway, I've got one at home. But Dexter Washer's uh, Harper Brush, which is celebrating its centennial this year. Uh, the Loudon Company, of course. Turney Wagon Works, Iowa Malleable, Fairfield Glove, uh, a flour mill, I can't remember, Stucky and Gossick Milling Company, uh, the Hawkeye Pump Company, couple of rope making machines down there and then uh, a Fairfield engine. And I think that's everybody that's represented. Oh, the L.J. Nelson and Company, company tack, tanks and galvanized steel manufacturers. Um, we would like to have some expansion on our Fairfield industry displays with emphasis maybe on Turney and Loudon, Harper Brush and, and Dexter. Uh, we have a double tub Dexter washer in our collection. We have a miniature turning wagon. We have a number of Loudon items. And I think that's one of the things we'd like to have out in the, the, the room just as you come off the elevator is to illustrate some of these things. But this is a nice start at least. We may not have the real items for sure, but we've got good pictures of them. Well, we do have some of the things in our collection. And we do have a couple of salesman sample Loudon uh, items up there, the stanchions and so forth. Uh, we have a couple of rope makers from uh, uh, the New Era Company and also uh, uh, Whitmore was one of the manufacturers. Uh, so we do have a number of things from these different companies that are represented on here. And this would make a nice start to, to something bigger and better. Because I think Fairfield was significant at the turn of the century in that we did have a lot of manufacturing and there was a lot of variety of manufacturing. And it also reflected the, you know, the economics of this era because there was so much of it that was uh, related to the agriculture of the time. So I think that's a focus that we want to really go for. You know, each museum needs to have a particular focus. I mean, collections of um, oh, pitchforks and cannonball beds are kind of a dime a dozen. I mean, they're nice and they're interesting, but it's good when a, a community can really celebrate itself and celebrate its uniqueness. And I think that's one way that we can do that if we ever get the job done, but it, it will happen one day. Now, while we're talking about the Loudon Company, I guess we were talking about other things too, but while we're talking about local manufacturing, we'll just show some of the Loudon things we've gotten a hold of. Um, Chet Danielson gave us a couple of portraits, and we don't have those down here. Who were those of? Uh, do you remember, Gene? It was the, it was the uh, Stubbs. Yeah, uh, portraits of the Stubbs family. Uh, two portraits of Mr. and Mrs. Stubbs, who were early Fairfield residents. And we frankly just didn't have room to put everything out. So we're, we're using this as a representative of, of Chet's donations. This is a, a package. And I'm going to find, I'm going to actually find the uh, picture. That's not the one. Here we go. OK, this, this is the, the packaging. It's never been open. It's a pair of wavy wings and fittings for the Loudon steel door. And this catalog that I have from the 40s 
predates the wavy wing, but you had a window that would tip open, and there was this little, this triangular uh, panel here that had a wavy top, and you could notch your door open at different, or your window open at different angles. And that's what this is. And so it's kind of nice to have an example of the original packaging that, that Bowden would ship things in. So I was tickled. Uh, Chet said that this was in his dad's barn for years and years and years, and, and he just caught me on the street one day and says, oh, you still want that stuff? And I said, sure. So <laughs> we picked it up, but I've tagged it so that uh, he gave me a harpoon fork too. But this is, this is the most unusual uh, thing that he gave us because you, you just don't see things in the original packaging anymore. Uh, the catalog I was showing was donated by Shirley Luzatter. She gave me a call one day. Uh, her dad, Frank Bell, was uh, you know, divesting himself of a lot of the possessions in their house. And she ran across this Loudon catalog, which illustrated the, the door, or the window, excuse me. But it also uh, illustrates this rafter bracket. And that's what Gene has in his hand. Uh, Frank had a bunch of this stuff, this old rusty Loudon hardware pieces. But here's a picture of the Loudon uh, rafter bracket illustrated. Now the one I, Gene has in his hand, I think is a little older because it has more holes uh, than this one. This one has two, four, seven holes. That one has eight. So I'll have to do a little investigating and see if I can date that a little more specifically. But this catalog is from the 40s. The other catalog that was among Frank Bell's possessions dates from 1919. And this is real exciting because there's a garage at 402 South 2nd, right there, right above my thumb, that I've just wondered about for years and years and years. It obviously has a Loudon cupola on the roof, but by golly, I think this is it illustrated in this catalog. So that helps us date that garage. And if I'd known this two years sooner, we might have been able to get that garage on the National Register. But that's another example of how you run across things every once in a while that you know, I was just flipping through this. I wasn't expecting to Is be able to pinpoint. Is it still in the garage? Yep, it's 402 yeah, South. Just across yeah, the street from right me. across from Frankie. But and then the, the garage here at the top by my chin looks a lot like the garage uh, behind Brank Fulton's home across from Slocus. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna have to look at that tomorrow when I go to school. I'll have this in my lap open and check it out. But the garage that's at the top here it was in Ohio, in Cincinnati. But if I remember correctly, the Fulton garage is very similar. There's, there is a garage. Uh, there is a garage farther out on, on East Burlington that's photo that's pictured in one of the catalogs too. Oh yeah, this and, is it right here. Yeah. Thanks for reminding. Yeah, this garage, and I can't remember. It's a it's a brick house on the south side of the street. It's kind of a bungalow house, but the garage is still there. Uh, the original doors are gone. I know we had originally thought about nominating this to the National Register because we were aware that it was illustrated. But because the original uh, doors are missing, it was probably not eligible. But it's still significant. It's on East Burlington. On East Burlington, south side of the street, and I... 700, 800. 700, 800 block. It's a, it's a substantial, kind of a heavy, blocky, uh, kind of bungalow-style house. And the garage is set pretty well back from the street, kind of behind the house to the side. Then we also had from the Frank Bell uh, collection a Loudon price list. And this is really nice because it has pictures of all the castings. And then in the back there's an index. You look up the casting number, and that tells you what it went to. So any kind of miscellaneous casting, and it's not too rusty, you can find the casting number and then find out what it was for. Because sometimes you just don't know. Because I know there's a couple things that I still haven't identified that Frank uh, Bell had. Um, they have lots of little holes in them, but I don't know what they were for. Now perhaps the most exciting, and this is going to seem strange, but this is what I was excited about. Mint condition shipping tags with the Y steel wire, um, whatever, string. <laughs> ties. <laughs> with the wire ties, thank you. But it says the Loudon Machinery Company, or from the Loudon Machinery Company, Fairfield, Iowa. And I've seen moth-eaten, ratty, old, blotchy, oily, yucky ones like this, but never a mint condition one. There were three or so of those. So that was exciting to have that. So all these little pieces of the pie, or the puzzle, uh, come together and, and enrich our understanding of, of what was really a very important 
Fairfield institution. And then there were a number of employee handbooks. This one's not dated, but the illustration, uh, the style of illustration looks like the 50s, maybe the 60s. Funny little cartoons. There's a knight in armor with an L on his breastplate. And he's uh, telling us that the management of the company is vitally interested in your safety. And that goes on and on. And then there were a number of uh, agreement pamphlets between the Loudoun Machinery Company and Fairfield Lodge Number 1293 of the International Association of Machinists. And this one's from 1953. And there were several of those. Some of them, there were several each year. Maybe there would be a, one that was put out in October and another one in November of a year. We have several of these from the 50s and 60s from Frank Bell, as well as some American Chain and Cable booklets and some little contract books from Iowa Malibu. So he, he had acquired a number of things. I guess he was a night custodian. And he'd see something in a wastebasket, and he'd be like me. I'd say, oh, well, that looks kind of neat. Let's not throw that away. In fact, I think this 1919 catalog, yeah, it, was, it belonged to uh, L.J. Pomeroy, Les Pomeroy. So that, and he was one of our informants. I was able to interview him just shortly before he passed away. And he gave us some inf inter interesting information about the Loudon Company oh, from when he started as a janitor there in about 1910, 1915, up until he retired about 1970. So it was kind of nice to have something that had belonged to Mr. Pumroy. But that takes care of the Frank Bell um, donations, and we really appreciate that. But it, you know, it was just nice. Shirley Lou's at her. I hadn't realized that that was her dad. Just called me up on the phone one day and said, we've got some stuff. Come look at it, see if you want it. So uh, that was a real pleasure getting to know them better and, and uh, add to our Loudon collection. You can see the donations come to the museum from a number of different locations, a number of different people throughout the community. And that's really been the history of uh, the museum ever since, well, for over 100 years. Uh, many of the collections within the museum came from Parsons missionaries that, uh, uh, through the Presbyterian Church that went uh, overseas or throughout the world and brought back things. And that's where a great many of our artifacts in the other room came from. But we've also had some very generous uh, uh, citizens within the community who have donated collections over the, that they've had over the years. And it really does help tell the story of Fairfield and Jefferson County. Mark, would you like to go over a little bit of the donation process, if anybody yeah. has things? Yeah, just, there, there's the form. Thank you, James. We have a very simple gift agreement. It basically says, uh, the undersigned does hereby make an outright, um, yeah, what happened to our, there it is, I'm sorry. I was afraid we were covering up a microphone. The undersigned does hereby make an outright gift of the following described personal property to the city of Fairfield on behalf of the Carnegie Historical Museum, Fairfield, Iowa, to wit. And then we write out an explanation of what they've donated. And the above does forever waive any right of possession or control of any kind of, or of any kind over said property. Then we date it and uh, the donor signs it and then the uh, board member or the witness signs it as well. And I, do they get a copy too? I'm sure. So we make a copy and, and each party gets to uh, have one. Um, interesting thing happened, was it last week that they came to look at the Fife? Dot Hellcamp got a, a phone call from somebody that said they had a flute in the museum. And of course we all panicked, we thought, oh my gosh, what flute? We've got a couple of them stashed around. There are musical instruments upstairs in some of the storage. And it turned out that it was the fife that's in the Civil War display. And then Dot ran across the uh, actual explanation that said that this flute had been carried for 4,000 miles during this battle and that battle, and associated with a particular Iowa infantry uh, regiment. So it was nice to actually find some documentation on something that's on display. And everything's documented like that. And we know it is. It's just a matter of accessing it. and. Uh, Fortunately, Dot knows where things are more than some of us. And she accessed it and made a copy and then sent that to the people that uh, came to look at it. The original call came from a man in Florida. And he and his brother from Wisconsin were meeting in Fairfield to do genealogical work. Uh, their, their ancestors were from the Salina area. 
and I believe Ogden was the last name. And uh, so it worked out to be a very nice, uh, every, all the pieces coming together, they were able to come view the, uh, the Five Fun exhibit, and we were able to pr provide them some information on the history of it. Mm -hmm. And we've learned something we didn't know before, so everybody was happy. And they were very generous. <laughs> oh, good. They gave each, each couple gave, a, gave us a check for $50. So we got a hundred dollars. It was well worth getting up that morning and coming up here and <laughs> letting them take a look. And we do have a Friends of the Museum program. If anybody wishes to donate to the museum, we're more than happy to take your membership. I think that pretty well covers it as far as I'm okay. concerned, Gene. Well, the one thing I'd like to emphasize in closing is that you can see that we have a lot of things donated to the museum. It takes a lot of time, a lot of hours to document everything to do displays, to do the things that are necessary to keep the, the museum viable and, uh, and open to the public. So if there's anybody watching on TV on FPAC, we'd certainly like to have you contact us if you're interested in helping with the museum, if you have any particular interests, all the way from construction to dusting to documenting, we can always use volunteers to help us. And uh, we do have a board of nine people. We do have two vacancies at this time one with a resignation and the other with the death of Ben Taylor. So we are uh, going to soon be adding two board members to come back up to our, our, our total of nine. Uh, it takes a lot of hours, a lot of effort to keep the museum open and going, and we'd certainly like to have help from the community too. Uh, in the different areas that we're researching right now, whether it be the industries, military, dog collections, civil war, if somebody has an expertise, we'd sure like to have them help us. Uh, Mark mentioned earlier the Sack and Fox Lapidary Club is going to be completely redoing our gem and mineral stones uh, displays. They're going to be documenting it, adding new lighting, new displays, building new displays for us. And so if there's a particular group that has an interest in one area of the museum's collections, uh, we sure like to have their help to, uh, to help us better display and tell a story with what we have. So, I guess for Dot Hellcamp and Mark Schaefer, and I'm Gene Lutke, thanks for coming up this afternoon, and thanks for watching on FPAC. We hope to see you at a later program. We have a number of things planned for us uh, in the coming months. Uh, I guess, Dot, do you remember what the, the November meeting program will be? It's eight years. Yeah. But we have various things, that, like for Christmas, we're going to have a, a pioneer history type of display with Dot Hellcamp. We have people coming that, uh, in the spring, they're going to do an old-fashioned music demonstration for us. Uh, we have, uh, we want to have another Civil War program. We're going to have, uh, uh, one of the things that we're going to be working on is a stained, cla stained glass uh, program. And what we would like to do is to photograph all the stained glass windows in the community, the churches and the homes, and make a photographic record of that so that we can have a program and tell about these, these particular stained glass pieces and where they came from and, and how they were done and, and a little bit of history about them. So we have a number of things in mind and if anybody out there would like to assist us in any program or any uh, work that we have to do, we'd sure like to have your help. So thank you very much. Um, I've got some things that you may have.